Hi, uh, welcome to tonight's Wild Wednesday webinar. Uh, I'm Bridget Barry of Farming for Nature, and I'm here with my co-host, Bravi, uh, sorry, Pranchi Brave from uh, Burn Bio Trust. We're here every Wednesday at 8 p.m. with a different guest speaker talking about farming, nature, and heritage. If you've missed any of our webinars so far, they're all available on our on the YouTube channel of Burn Bio Trust, so feel free to catch up at your leisure. And likewise, if you know someone who's unable to make tonight's session or um, or you have to cut out early, again, the recording of this will be up on Burnbio's YouTube um, site within the next couple of days. So feel free to share it. Um, if you haven't joined us before, the format is about 35 to 40 minutes talk with a Q&A session afterwards. If you'd like to ask uh, Kate a question, what you have to do is you just type it into the Q&A box on your Zoom panel at perhaps the bottom of your screen. And then Prangeli and myself will take a selection of questions at the end. So on to tonight's speaker, we are delighted to welcome from West Meath, um, farmer Kate Egan, who is also a Farming for Nature ambassador. Um, very apt considering it's both uh, World Bee Day and Biodiversity Week, um, Kate runs a nine acre chemical free farm dedicated to biodiversity and permaculture in Ballymore in County West Meath. Herself and her partner Tom bought the farm about four years ago and we believe they're a great example of what can be achieved uh, both in terms of habitat building and yield production in sh such a short time. So Kate, over to you. We're delighted that you're joining us and uh, good luck and we look forward to hearing your talks. Okay, uh, do I share screen now, Bridget, or? Yeah, when you're ready, yeah, so work away. So you can just share your screen and, and start, yeah. Okay, let's see. Share screen. Okay, so hopefully everyone can uh, see the presentation and not focus too much on the awkward videos that webinars seem to have these days. So uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for having me uh, here to talk today. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about is literally our experience in uh, starting a farm like this, why we started it and how it's going and kind of what we've learned and some of the things we found useful along the way. So any questions that you might have around it, please uh, do feel free to ask at the end. And um, this is my first time doing a webinar, so uh, bear with me, hopefully we'll, we'll get through it together. Um, so the name of our farm is On Green Glass Farm, which basically means the green sun. And the reason that we chose that name was the focus that we felt it had on sustainability, um, and how everything that is grown, like the food and vegetables we eat are literally the light of the uh, sun made green, essentially. Um, and it's the driver of our ecosystems and our planets and it felt uh, right around the balance. So that'll even tell you straight away some of the values that we were coming from as we started and we bought this piece of land. So this is the piece of land that we bought back in 2016. We originally purchased, um, we wanted to purchase land with our, our home when, because both of us were interested in um, conservation, ecology, nature, the environment. My background is as an ecologist and environmental educator. So for many years, I've kind of dreamt of creating a sanctuary or a, an area for wildlife and, um, and planting native trees and, and just having a beautiful space for people for people to live or to, to see or to, to be there and look for animals. Um, the piece of land that we bought is literally just these four fields, one, two, three, and um, four. And so it amounts to about nine acres, which is a very small holding and probably um, for most people, uh, a size of land that wouldn't make a financially viable farm at all. So it was the same week that we purchased the land that I found out I was being made redundant. So my, my aim in life was never to be a farmer that I can remember, at least not since I think I was about eight years old. And um, it sort of kind of happened and grew bit by bit um, and it's still sort of forming now. But as you can see, these are just basic green fields. There's nothing on them. We, they um, were grazed by cattle and horses prior to us buying it. We were very lucky to get this little piece of land here, um, which was kind of an old uh, growth, uh, well, oldish growth, ash grove. So it was an area that was coppiced 
there was this um, kind of dugout quarry. The, um, the land is kind of around near an esker. And so there were loads of stones that so had been dug out and they had, whoever had owned the land beforehand had let these um, ash grow and thrive. So there's a lovely um, uh, population of birds and wildlife that already existed before, um, before we moved in. But since we've been in, we've started to turn some of the fields into kind of uh, different projects. So this particular field is our young food forest field. You can see here we put in what's called a geodomes. We're hoping to run some education workshops, hopefully later this year if restrictions uh, as and when they ease. It's hard to tell, mainly because I'm not a very good photographer, but also it's quite hard to tell and show on a photograph how a place has changed that much. Um, and our, our documentation of this field isn't as good as, as some of the others, but actually the other side of this field is, is quite heavily planted with over two or 300 fruit, uh, nut, berry producing foods and trees, trees for medicine. Um, the idea is to make a, stru uh, a structure like a forest, so like in, using ecological structures to create something that produces food by itself um, with a as a self-sustaining system. It's going to be a long, uh, a long project. It's not something that will happen overnight. Um, but it is starting to fill in and it is starting to produce and it's very exciting to see it changing as it's going along. And then this is just our orchard. So we've got about 40 or 50 uh, different fruit and nut trees. Uh, it was 40 fruit, uh, nut trees and 50 fruit. Uh, and we have chose uh, purposely to not just grow one type. Uh, we wanted to grow um, a variety so that we would have greater resilience um, if there was either a disease or weather that didn't suit a particular type of fruit or nut. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So essentially when we moved in, um, we wanted to just grow food for ourselves. That was the goal. And being made redundant, I had to take a little bit of time to figure out exactly what I wanted to do. And I really, really enjoyed growing food. I've been growing it for maybe a couple of years before that, but like 2009 was the first time I planted uh, anything. I grew one potato and three Brussels sprouts, but they were really, really great. Um, and I was kind of addicted at that point. And I kind of started off on this huge learning journey. But um, by the time we moved in here, it was a whole other level. I didn't know any of the methods that, you know, that we now use or that we're now aware of. So we rotivated a small patch and we put down some potatoes and we were very excited as they started to grow up. So this is just our first year. And then by year two, we decided, we had, I had said, oh, it was great fun and very easy to grow a few potatoes for myself and some, uh, we kind of had extra veg and tomatoes. We were like, that can't be that hard. Uh, little did I know that as we ventured in and decided to try and make this a, an actual business. Um, so you can see here, we're starting to, you know, we put a fence around the area that we're going to use. We're starting to delineate it and uh, to increase the amount of bed space. And we were also starting to learn an enormous amount about regenerative agriculture practices using technique, permaculture techniques, no dig methods, minimum till, um, you know, uh, organic um, ways and permaculture ways of managing pests and disease. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about growing techniques, but I am more than happy to take any questions on it later on. And then finally, last year, as we went up to two tunnels um, and we really kind of got a, much more into the swing of things, you're going to see we had a really full uh, garden at that point. Interestingly enough, um, this area here and just here um, is what we grew most of the food on, along with the tunnels. And um, most of this here are some very expertly grown weeds, which, uh, you know, every gardener should know how to grow. Um, so we have a team, uh, our, our cat Gaston keeps down the rodent population, uh, Liddy, kinda, our dog, takes care of everyone. We have 30, uh, 35 chickens now, I think, uh, that produce eggs for our community supported agriculture schemes. Uh, and they, uh, our chickens and ducks keep down the pests of um, slugs and snails and, uh, and other um, animals. The, our pig here, Ola, she is a pet pig. We have kept pigs for meat um, just for ourselves on occasion, but she is with us for life um, and she's brilliant. She 
clear some ground if we need it cleared for certain things. But we move her around a lot because she can be very heavy on the ground. So we want to make sure that her impact isn't too severe. But she's also helped us line our ponds, our wildlife ponds, um, and has become a, a, a very popular pet in the meantime. And then we have some horses that we work with with our we have a social farming, um, so people with intellectual uh, disability or mental health challenges will often come to the farm for a 10 or, or a 12 week uh, stint and they'll work with the different animals and uh, they work with us on that program. So how exactly do we farm with nature? You know, how are we different? How is it that we're different? Well, the main way that we're different is that we've we've put nature at a very high value within our farm because we had to ask ourselves the question when we were shifting and moving from hobby to um professional to an actual business that could sustain us how could we do that without losing the values that we wanted to start out with in the first place um, how could we make sure that we weren't going to end up compromising on why we wanted to have land and what, how we want to have it and, and, and be able to live within it. So we chose that, we decided that we would actually just dedicate a small space um, to growing. And when you're using, um, I'm going to say the word intensive uh, growing, but I don't mean that in the way conventional uh, farming is intensive. This is labor intensive. We're chemical free, we're not certified organic yet, but we do not use any uh, synthetic fertilizers, pest, um, pesticides or herbicides. Um, and then all of our decisions around how we manage our garden is all around improving the soil, uh, improving biodiversity and, you know, and increasing food production. The reason we're happy to improve our biodiversity is because the healthier our soil is and the healthier our surrounding biodiversity is, the healthier our plants are actually going to be. Um, the birds around the area will keep down insect populations, but there is going to be a transition as we shift. We're going to have a boom and bust cycle that happens in e with ecological systems where you're overloaded with a particular species until the predator comes along. So we find different ways of managing those transitions until maybe a more stable state has, has been reached. Um, we use weed control methods such as black plastic that is uh, put on the ground and it just covers it for um, about six months. And that's, we recycled that from old silage bales that farmers were going to throw out. We use fleece to keep our, um, our crops warm and reduce the amount of tunnel space that we need. And we encourage um, animals like uh, hedgehogs and insects, of course, like bees, to increase our population pollination and to keep down our slug, uh, slug population. So we're all the time looking at what methods can we use that will really improve the land. And as, as we developed our business and as we kind of set forward with it, we, I um, was inspired by certain models and concepts um, that I'm going to share with you now. So okay, here. So biomimicry is a concept about how do we look to nature to kind of solve our solutions and our answers and, um, and find answers to, to the, our, these problems. So we wanted to know, you know, we, we asked the question, how does nature grow food? Well, in nature, there's no waste, there's no addition of fertilizer and there's no extra, there's no pesticides or herbicides. Everything, um, works as a system. The waste of one thing becomes the, um, the, the fertilizer for something else. Um, the, the, the predator of another animal keeps a population down, allowing things to grow, but not letting anything take over. So we wanted to have our farm function like um, a system um, and like an ecological system as much as we possibly can within the realms of, of reality. Because it's a certain size, we can't just have it function exactly as a natural system, but we can take cues and learn lessons. So the, we compost all the waste from the animals and we put it through um, you know, a, a proper composting system that ensures that it's, um, you know, it's safe and it's not carrying any sort of uh, bacteria that can um, harm the food. We um, turn it and then we'll add that fertility in, to the soil, building in the 
um, organic matter and improving the biological life within the soil. So we look to nature as a model, a model for how we can do things, and then also a measure for our decisions. Is what we're doing right? Is the decision to, um, you know, to start off and take on an extra piece of land or to um, rotivate here or, or, you know, to how exactly that we're farming or to use different pieces of technology, is that impacting our wildlife? Is it allowing us to grow more food in a sustainable way? So we're able to use that, you know, if we're noticing um, some of our actions are having a severely negative impact on our biodiversity and our wildlife, we're able to reflect on that and kind of, and, and, and reassess. Um, and then we look as nature, uh, to nature as a mentor for those systems that we can copy and, and emulate. And then the other one um, that I think is very interesting is natural capital. So natural capital um, is, is what's well, essentially the, the natural version of built capital. So you have natural capital and you have built capital. Now built capital is when you have an asset. So you've, you've built a house or a car or a machine and the most valuable that will be is the day that it's built and finished and can be used from then on it depreciates so anyone who has to do accounts will notice that if you buy a laptop the price you know you have this depreciation as you put it through your accounts because the value of that reduces over time with natural capital um your value increases over the time you know when you the um the least amount of value a forest will have is the day it's planted, but over time it's going to become much more uh, valuable, both ecologically and financially. Um, so what we're sort of kind of, we want to make sure that we're farming in such a way that our farm in 30 or 40 or 50 years is going to have three or 400 times the value that it does today. Again, ecologically and financially. Um, as opposed to a lot of traditional or conventional methods that, um, that don't look after the soil or the ecology in the same way, their farms, you, you will see the land depreciating over time. And you'll know the World, so World Soil Health Organization has said that we have, I think it's 30 or 60 harvests left um, before our soils are completely worn out because they are a finite resource unless they're reinvested in. So how we looked at building nature into our business model, because we had to make sure that while we might have had high ideals and we might have, you know, um, a really nice sort of, we'd like to be close to nature and we want to have an ecological farm and to make sure that um, there's a lot of wildlife on site. We also had to make sure that we were actually going to be able to live off of what we produce and um, where are we going to be able to make a living? And this is a really big question and one that I get an awful lot. So, I sort of, um, sort of kind of came up with the idea that we look at it like a pyramid. Ev underpinning everything is biodiversity and sustainability. Okay, this is um, where we, you know, we manage our farming practices, we ensure that um, our ethos stays the same, that we have native hedgerows and we diversify. Um, we have you know, a huge diverse, diversity of habitats to make sure we have the greatest biodiversity and therefore you know, the most resilient um, kind of ecological system. We've done an awful lot to, uh, to ensure that. So we've planted over 500 native trees and 200 fruit and nut trees. And, um, and we've set aside um, you know, about two or three acres that we're trying or hoping will evolve into a, uh, a native woodland uh, over time to, uh, to complement the, the, the woodland that was already there on site. Um, and then from that, when we have a healthy ecological system and we've invested in our soils, we are able to produce really high quality, local, chemical free food that um, is actually in huge, uh, hugely high demand in restaurants, cafes, um, and even through local customers and markets now, particularly in the current situation, um, we've noticed a huge, huge increase in demand, which has been really interesting um, to see and, and uh, very positive. When we provide that food and we're able to create it and act as a, a source of food for our community, then we're also able to start to incorporate community services. So we provide social farming, 
ecological education. We have a workshop space that as we develop it, we hope it might be able to be for hire, for yoga classes or um, mindfulness, um, depending on what people in the area might be interested in. Um, we're also hoping to host a toddler's nature group to offer opportunities um, and more of a social enterprise uh, nature to allow people to get out into a natural, natural-ish landscape um, that maybe they haven't had access to before around the area. Um, and then finally, um, we wanted to bring in some boutique tourism products as well, because remembering all the time to have an eye that we want to be providing things that um, can bring in a financial return as well, while also um, staying within our, our ethos and our, our core values. So it's all well and good for us to say that we put nature first and that that's our priority along with, um, along with producing you know, really good food. But how do we know that? So one of the uh, things that we're starting to figure out is how do we measure efficacy? How do we know um, that we're actually on the right track and that we're getting somewhere? So the, we, we're looking at a few different areas. So we're looking at how much food are we actually growing? Is that increasing? So to date, our first year, we would have grown around 2,000 euros worth of food um, on that uh, about quarter acre. And now this year, we should be hitting, I think it would be safe to say we'll hit around 25,000 euros worth of food that we'll have produced. Um, whether, whether we manage to sell all that and get it harvested and get it maintained. And I would feel fairly confident to say that can probably be tripled in the same amount of space within the next couple of years and most the main reason it's taking so long to get there is that we've had to learn how to do this and we're very much so learning we're not experts i'm currently taking um jim cronin's market gardening course which i would highly recommend it's made a huge difference already to our, our growing and um is you know he he grows through um organic methods as well so there's no compromise on how we want to farm and how we want to look after our land the next thing that we're looking at is imported fertility. So the more fertility we can be producing on site, whether it's growing our own um, kind of green manures and composts, producing compost from the animals on site, um, or even just growing grasses and silages to use for mulches, um, the more we can do of that, the, again, we're starting to see that we're becoming more and more sustainable. But there will always be um, a reality that you'll always be bringing in a little bit. Um, particularly if you're going down the road of the no dig methods that we do. But anything we bring in is certified organic um, and we know the source and we go as local as we can. So the next way of measuring uh, kind of efficacy, we get into you know, the diversity of habitats and the diversity of species. At the moment, we're working off anecdotally. So this is the first year that we found that a frog has spawned in our, the pond that we've made, which is very, again, little things, very exciting. Um, we have bats that have consistently roosted in our attic for the last uh, four years and probably before we moved in. And um, they're a mix of common pipistrelle and soprano pips. And um, there's over 210 of them, I think. But we've put in, a beehive, a conservation beehive. So it's not one for extracting honey, it's one to mainly um, provide habitat for bees in the area and hopefully a, a point of education and learning them from people when they come on site. So one of the ways that we obviously um, are using the things that we've installed and put in to measure, but then they're going to be incidental things that we haven't expected uh, that crop up. So we start to see wildflowers that we hadn't expected. So we saw a lot of um, cuckoo flower this uh, this year and as a result we also saw a huge increase in the amount of orange tip butterflies that we saw on site and um, we're hoping to team with a university or a college next year and see if we can get um, maybe a, an undergrad student to do some assessments so that we can start to maybe have a bit of a baseline and then maybe kind of redo an assessment and five or 10 years again and see, are we actually doing what we say? And then maybe compare to our neighboring farms, which are both cattle farms. And, uh, you know, they would have pretty severe, well, they'd have more intense hedge cutting, spraying, um, and pretty much monoculture uh, ryegrass um, on, their, on their land. So where do we see us going? 
and what does the future hold? Um, so we see ourselves as, I suppose, a myriad of different things. We're a social enterprise, we're a community resource, a unique tourist, uh, tourist destination. I'm hoping that we can develop as an ecological education centre for the region. Um, we want to be enrich the food landscape, which um, in the Midlands, you know, it's actually got some of the best soil in the country, some of the best land, but there's actually a dearth of really good vegetables. There seems to be a generation coming out though, um, and I'm hearing more and more of small, uh, small scale farmers like myself, um, and it's it's very exciting to see that kind of coming on and that network that network happening um an example so we want to be an example of a profitable and a sustainable ecological farm so we want to show people i mean one of our big goals is to show that you can do this and um, you can make a living off of it and you can still you know hold true to core values you don't have to compromise the two we are very fortunate because we didn't when we bought the land it was a clean slate in some respects we hadn't invested in a previous conventional method or style. So we were uh, naive, but, um, but we were also, um, you know, fortunate we kind of were coming at this a bit wide eyed and, and, you know, starting from fresh. Whereas there are many other situations where people are kind of entrenched into um, a particular farming um, method or style because of, and they've invested in it. So it's very hard to step out of that. Um, like that's definitely a challenge. Um, we'd like to create somewhere between five and 10 jobs uh, for the community um, and maybe who knows, have, have something like a cafe on site, but they're all future goals and we've enough to be doing at the moment. But one of the things that I think is important and I'd love to see happening, and there's a group called Tal of Bio that are working hard um, on this kind of advocacy where they're advocating for better farming practices and a better, you know, stronger farming community. And that would when farmers do not just produce food, whether it's dairy, meat, um, eggs or grain or, or vegetables, we, when farming is done well, they also provide ecosystem services like carbon sequestration, wildlife habitat, it builds topsoil and fertility, reduce air pollution, climate resilient food, and um, the you know even places for um mental health and um recuperation and tourism so there's a huge amount that is probably not being recognized either in the price of food or the supports that are given to people and farmers who are trying to either change the way they're farming or uh, progress their farms um, in that way i mentioned climate resilient food and i realized i hadn't touched on it before it, the our approach to climate resilience is kind of copying, um, I suppose, nature's motto, there's um, resilience and strength in diversity. So we could just grow salad leaf or we could just grow, you know, potatoes or one or two other things. But our preference, um, I suppose our interest is to grow a wide diversity of things. So, because one, it's, um, it's more fulfilling for us. It's more interesting. We, you know, we enjoy growing this range of different foods and, and introducing people to some new foods they might not have heard before. Um, but also that diversity allows us that, you know, if we have a year where there's really bad blight or there's um, really bad frost, um, and particularly at the moment, you know, we lost this year, we've lost most of our cherry and our plums, but our apples and our pears have actually done, they're, they're surviving okay. So, it, you know, having that diversity is allowing us, um, allowing us a certain degree of resilience in, in the current market and with the climate being so changeable. So in four years, you are kind of three to four years, uh, you can imagine that that's quite a lot of work and it's very challenging when you love something and you're passionate about it to actually hold yourself back and maybe not do quite as much work. Um, although uh, our, our new, new baby is definitely teaching us how not to do work um, and managing to reduce what we can get done. But the, we, you do have to be careful. Burnout is a very, burnout and um, mental health are two big issues for people in the farming community, both between a sense of isolation and working, you know, quite considerable hours um, with very, very rare days off. So trying to sort out strict times off, plan, 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 
set up systems and learn as much as you can about the different methods and figure out what works for your land, your lifestyle, the vegetables you want to grow, um, you know, and really try and figure out that. And the rest are kind of other things that are just sort of very useful in life anyway, in terms of you mitigate your expectations. Um, nature will no doubt teach you the lessons if you're refusing to, to learn them uh, just on paper, um, you know, not planting things out too soon or thinking that things will grow at a certain rate that you're hoping for and, and they just don't. Um, social media is dangerous in all terms, but even for farming as well, there's nothing worse than going online and seeing someone's beautiful, clean, weed-free tunnel and, you know, tomatoes already, you know, three feet high in the air and yours aren't even in the ground yet. So that can definitely build senses of anxiety and just a good sense of humour. Um, yeah, the working uh, on a farm will definitely provide you plenty of plenty of fodder for laughing or crying, depending on what you prefer. But it's it's if you can keep your head up and you can keep working, it's a wonderful way to work. It's a wonderful um, landscape. It's fulfilling and it's a unique uh, lifestyle that I suppose we we feel very privileged to be able to um, to live and provide. Uh, so I think I think that's it. So it's about thirty minutes. I think that's if that's okay. Um, Great, okay. Do you want to unshare your screen there? Okay, um, so unshare it. Stop share. Yeah, so, so you're back to back to here. Yeah. Well, listen, thanks a million for that, and thanks so much for sharing as, uh, quite a few of your you know the concepts and your model. I think it's really useful for people because there are a lot of questions. I mean, some of the comments are around thanks for sharing, especially that concept of um, natural capital people aren't kind of hadn't thought about that maybe as much as they they could and they should and, and also the resources and stuff that you've put on there at the end are really useful for people and um, so just to delve into the questions um we'll see so first of all um there's a question here from Yvonne. one of the arguments that traditional farmers raise about this type of farming is the intensity of the labor required how do they manage to harvest the crop, etc.? How, how do you manage the intensity of the labor required? Systems, like it's, yeah, the labor is huge. Um, sorry, is there feedback there, Bridget, or is it okay? No, no, perfect, yeah. Um, sorry. And the labor is huge. Um, it's, it's, there's no doubt about it. You need to look after your body, you need to be fit, and you need to be strong. Um, there's ways that we reduce it, so we definitely work with volunteers from overseas. Um, we, the main way to manage it is systems. So one of the things that's starting out, we were kind of trying to please everyone. So someone would call me and I'd be so excited to make a sale that I'd go, yeah, no problem, I can have that ready. And that would be on Monday. And then the same thing would happen Tuesday and Wednesday and you'd just be harvesting every day. So you start to get into a routine of we harvest on Tuesdays, we sell on, we deliver on Wednesday, and then that's it. If someone wants something the following week, you know, they have to kind of come back for that because you, you'll spread yourself very, very thin and stuff won't happen. The other way in terms of systems is really getting to grips with either no dig method or hoeing on a regular basis. So this is one of the things we, we have not yet managed to get to grips with weeds this until this year um, it's been kind of the bane of our life now we're working very hard but what we've decided to do is sort of like we've cleared a couple of areas and we're, we're they're not going to get back on um out of control again so we're using um you know we've got good quality hose and good quality equipment now um, and so it takes you know maybe an hour to get um you know at the moment the area that's that needs hoeing eventually the whole place might take about a half a day but that's when the whole place is being done that'll be uh you know the income from that will hopefully leave us to be in a position to hire someone so it's yeah really systems you know do small a couple of crops well in the beginning because when you're harvesting just one or two crops it's much easier to do that quicker on on, on a bigger volume and scale as well um, but there's brilliant, brilliant people to look at, such as uh, Jim Cronin, um, uh, Charles Dowding, and Richard Perkins is probably the best at the moment in terms of the systems that he's putting out there and explaining to people. He's showing how it's, it's really, it is manageable. The climate is different, so you sort of have to take it and learn certain things from him and, and take information from other people. 
I okay. think it helps. Other than that, it is just it's a it's a huge ton of work, but it is becoming it's we're noticing a much better return for our time lately this year. Right, thank you. Thanks, Kate. I think that answers the question. One of the questions I was going to ask, uh, Finton asked, going, um, sorry, Sean asked, is it difficult to get a fair price for all the effort, uh, the quality produce, the ecological benefits? You know, you seem to be putting on a lot of effort, but you, I think you answered that, that you, you, you kind of see the rewards now. The next question was, going forward, do you see the food production as your main source of income or the social and community aspects? Um, I, the moment, actually, it's the food, it's the food production. And one of the reasons, again, you know, I talked about like a resilience in terms of plant, planting um, a lot of different crops. Um, in the beginning, we were getting more income from the social side of things, but that's because we really were earning so little from the crops. But I think now that we're starting to under, really understand our growing methods a lot better, and that's definitely thanks to actually taking time to, to doing some more intensive courses. Um, It'll, it'll be the, the vegetables that will probably bring in the most amount of money in the end. There's a fantastic uh, book called Miraculous Abundance, and I listed it there. And it's about a French couple in, well, a couple in France. And they did a research and they sort of um, estimated that a qu on a quarter of an acre with one person, they wanted to look at the minimum amount of land available that would sustain one person financially and could be run by, managed by one person. And they came up with a quarter of an acre to produce around 20 to 25,000 euros worth of veg over, a, over the course of a year, which when you think of the value or amount of uh, money over a quarter of an acre, if you're farming any other type of um, food, it's, it's not comparable at all. It's probably the best, but, um, but yeah, so that's, that's, I'm going to be honest, I've forgotten the question. <laughs> no, I think you answered it. I think you answered it. Yeah. No, you said the food will bring in more money than the, than, or at least have. To, but so we, we hope, so the, yeah, sorry, just one on that branch. We, we wanted to keep a variety of ang arms to our business because if there came a point where there was an issue with the food or we had a massive crop failure, we still would have these other streams of income that they would support us. That makes sense. Uh, so Sophie Nicole asks, Kate, how do you manage to keep wildlife, some say pests, um, off your produce with natural methods? So there's loads of different methods. And again, they're all specific to each different pest. But my, my personal kind of perspective, and this may be a little bit naive, is the idea that if we have our, our garden and our permaculture, our market garden surrounded by a strong and healthy ecosystem there are losses should be so minimal because there are so many predators and prey to um there so it should sort of self-manage but in within the site i don't know if we've just been incredibly lucky but um we haven't had that much of an issue and a lot of research is coming out now saying that plants that have are much healthier have much greater resilience to pests so you'll have plants that are if they're grown in soil that can keep them at kind of top health you don't notice them with green fly quite the same way you will as something that's weaker because pests will will go for the weaker weaker plants and weaker crops so we keep them healthy we um, ensure that there are predator habitat for predators around and um We've been very fortunate, and we don't. We have gone out like the first um, couple of years. We went out each night when we had the luxury to do that, and collected slugs, which is highly exciting activity. <laughs> but it did work. It's made a massive impact on our populations. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, um, Kate. You are you're probably surrounded by the neighbouring lands and farms where chemicals are used. Do you have? Do you need to protect your farm from negative effects of these these neighbouring farms? And also, do you think that would be a problem for you going forward if you want to get an organic status for your farm? So, no, I think the organic status has a reality to it. They require a two, um, it's a two meter buffer from the land. And that's essentially a hedgerow width kind of area. Now, we would have a little bit more than that on one side and then a huge area of that on the other because our, our, we have a whole field on the other side. Um, we don't love it because I'm aware, unfortunately I had a farmer try to convince me that, uh, I think he was spraying um, 
roundup on the field next to us the first year we moved in. And I hence there before for became the organic lady in the community, unfortunately. But the um, he was trying to say that it just washes away in the soil. And I was saying, that's not exactly how it works. And, and it can persist and it can be an issue. But there, there is just, you, there has to be some standard that's set. And so the organics set the standard of a, the two meter buffer kind of riparian zone so that um, you can still use um, space. And yeah, we, we, we meet that fulfillment and there's really not much more we can do than that. We'd love to be able to have more land on the other side to ensure better um, security that way, but it's, it's as much as anyone can do, unfortunately. So Margaret Murray is asking you, is it difficult for young farmers like yourself to get land? And was, did you find it difficult to become a farmer? Um, do you have a herd number? Uh, I do have a herd number. You have to have a herd number to be considered a farmer. Um, unfortunately, I'm because I haven't done the green cert and I've made that an active choice because for me, it didn't have the best value of time in terms of learning because I'm not using machinery, I'm not spraying, I, I don't have a large amount of livestock and that's a lot of the focus of the, the green cert curriculum is, is around that, which means I am currently inelig ineligible for any grants which does make, you know, moving forward a bit more challenging than, than perhaps for others. Um, the it, access to land is a big issue for sure. There's, we were extremely fortunate in that when, at the time we bought, we could just about afford here. We both had jobs at the time. Obviously that changed very quickly, but um, we purposely bought a place with a low enough mortgage that you know, even if things were really bad, we could, we could manage. But access to land is a, is a big issue. Like we, I would like to expand and I think we'd be ready to expand in a couple of years, but I, I don't know where we'd, we'd be able to get land. So there's that mindset set still exists very much so in Ireland. So it, yeah, big, I think it is a big issue. Um, okay, this is the question from Melina Quinn. Uh, she says, it's a great talk uh, regarding measuring the impact of your sustainable practices on soil health. Do you carry out soil testing? So we do carry out a soil test um, every, we're hoping to do it every year, but at the moment it's kind of every two years. And um, unfortunately, the soil, current soil test that we've found and been using doesn't hugely tell us an enormous amount. Really, we carry out our own personal soil test, which is essentially kind of uh, just a look, look at the soil profile, and we carry that out each year. And because of taking this particular course, I've started to learn kind of even more in-depth um, ways of helping the soil. And so when we saw a range of soils within the class, um, it was kind of phenomenal to see the one person who, you know, uh, Jim had worked with the previous year and had gotten them to sow a green manure. And he was explaining, you know, the benefits of that to the soil. And it was like looking at, you know, the difference between eating kind of milk chocolate and gravel in terms of the comparison between the, the two. So we're, we're hoping to, to do that this year you can tell an awful lot about soil from just the look, the touch, the smell, the feel, and um, how the roots go through it. Our soil is a very heavy, sticky clay that doesn't hold water. So it's because it's also got a lot of sand in it, weirdly. And in summer, in winter, it's like, you know, it's really, really uh, thick and mucky. And then in summer, it bakes as hard as a rock. So our big, big goal is to add a huge amount of, um, uh, what's the word? My brain is tired, I apologize. Um, organic material to it, so to try and build its ability to hold moisture during the summer and to drain better um, and, and have greater fertility. So yes to soil tests, but what they can tell you depending on the soil test method that you use, uh, it depends. It just depends on what you're looking for, you're looking to know. To the best of my knowledge, there isn't one that can tell you whether you have sprayed pesticides or herbicides recently or throughout the year um, accurately. Or Because I asked them, when I called them up, I asked them if they could tell what would that and so on. She said no. So unless her information is wrong, then I haven't heard of one. Sorry. 
So, Kate, here's a question from Amit Vasbucci. Um, would it be a goal to aim for natural farming when nature decides the crops that are grown on the farm? Um, so that's sort of, so that's kind of how we want to run the food forest. We want to build a structure like a forest and sort of let natural systems work there and function there. That, the idea in terms of trying to maybe set up a system where, you know, you have, a, it's about what you want to grow. And then also if you want to have a, a functional business, because if you want to grow for yourself, you can experiment with that. You can work with that. Like there's methods of not just no dig, but like where people, they'll, they'll just scatter and see what grows. And that's great fun. And it's very interesting. And I've had instances of like that in the tunnel where seed has been left over. And it's been fascinating to see what, you know, your volunteer seeds are. But that's extremely difficult to have reliability for a, an actual system. If I'm understanding the question right. Um, mm -hmm unless it's a method I just don't know of. And perhaps, um, I, I mean, I wouldn't know a huge amount about it, but the, I, I think like, I think the, the big piece is about trying to balance idealism and reality around, you know, being able to predict how many kilos of what vegetable you will have every week because you're, you're week to week, you're, you're letting your customers know. Okay. Hey, this is a question from Anonymous. Is this a sustainable lifestyle choice? Do you find you're working all the time? enjoyable as the work may be yeah so the the first the first year was lovely uh kind of grew a bit here did a bit there and uh, yes we were at maybe working in the garden because we because we enjoyed it um yes it is if you manage it right but you really do like this year we really needed to avoid burnout and we sort of sat down and we're like we have to take two days off a week just that's it Obviously, animals always need to be fed, so there is there is a degree of work that way. You also have to be prepared that if you want to go away anywhere, you know, that at a drop of a hat, that's gone. You have to find someone who can farm sit. And whatever about house sitting, but, you know, farm sitting for, you know, 35 chickens, a pig, three horses, uh, ducks, and God knows what else, and, and plants is definitely a challenge. But if you are good at planning and managing systems, yes, it's definitely a sustainable life choice. And then also just, um, like, like I said, mitigating your expectations and, and how much you're growing and, and that kind of thing. But there's always a bit of a chicken and egg. So what I have found, we've been very fortunate in that whether we've just hit a niche in the market or this is something people are crying out for, our demand has, seems to constantly exceed our, our produce. And so we do find ourselves working quite a lot at the moment because we're working up to be able to hire another person full time. And once we have that, that should balance out a bit as well. Okay, so that slightly leads on to my next question from Fintan Damore. Is there a risk that your food may become so popular that you may need to bring in more production and in doing so lose habitat? So this is, a, a, again, a very good question. And it's something we have had to sit down and say, do we, you know, I, I feel like if we, as and when we have the whole garden area up to production, and that's the area inside that pallet fence you would have seen in the picture, which is around three quarters of an acre to an acre. But we, we sort of, we've made the decision that that's all we're going to farm in that way. Um, so yes, there is, there is that, I don't know if it's a risk per se, that demand possibly can happen, but I guess it's around the choices that we make um, to, um, do you, know, do you want to expand your business or don't you, you know? Um, so I suppose it's the difference between whether people want to franchise or, or not, you know, if they have a different type of business. So we've made the choice that if we, if we can make our living off of this particular three quarters of an acre to an acre, we don't see why we would need to expand that area. We're probably more interested in trying different things. Um, and I think that the risk to nature is more to do with, the philosophy and ethics of the people managing the land rather than the actual demand, if that makes sense. Like if the increased demand, the, the demand can increase, but it's down to the farmer, whether they put the natural areas at risk or not, which is, is something we don't have a desire to do. We're, we're very happy with that little area. Connor Ruan has asked, have you noticed a difference in zero dig versus digging on soil quality? Yes. So, 
so we we use we use a different uh, how do we say this we use different methods our aim is to move to almost um, a completely no dig system now there's two choices if you want to go no dig you can go straight away no dig and you just put down plastic or something to kill the weeds and you put huge huge mounds of really really good well well rotted compost so you're importing all of your fertility and then you top it up every year we couldn't afford to import that because it would actually end up being very expensive so what we've done is our preference was to work on re, um, improving the soil and to do that we have had to dig initially and we've incorporated um, to incorporate a combination of horse manure and organic um, spent mushroom compost. Um, and now we're using biological um, micro microbial tonics to inoculate the soil to increase the biological life in it. So the bacteria and the insects and, and fungal life. So we hope, uh, well not we hope, we will see, and we have seen, I've seen this year a huge change in our soil, but also our plants, which is really what, what gives us good indication. Um, so yes is the answer, but I don't want to sort of say, look, we're not there yet. Um, we've seen improvements, particularly if you go and you see some of the other parts where we didn't manage to get to do any work on it. You can, you can definitely see the, the, weed, the weed load is higher, the, it gets hard very fast in summer, you know, the, the water retention and drainage is not as good as the beds that we've been working with. But you can, if you, you know, there are the two choices with, with the no dig. So we've been taking our time to, to kind of find our way with that a little bit for the right method for our soil. So Kate, I don't expect you to know everything about everything, but Patrick Hahi has asked, do you have any uh, comment on CAP 2020 reform? And if you don't, I can move on to the next question. Yeah, I, th I think I don't know enough about it to comment on it, if I'm honest. Uh, if, yeah, I, it's something I'm happy to discuss in another, maybe on yeah. another time. Yeah, sure. And then the other thing, um, Jonah Donahue has asked, uh, what grant aids have you found useful? Um, she mentions your biosphere and structure in the first slide. And did, have you, did you get a grant aid and what grant aids have you found useful? Yeah, because um, as you'll see, you remember from my, my pyramid, our, uh, We've positioned ourselves as a, um, again, sorry, slow brain. Uh, I'm tourism. I've almost lost words since I've had a child. Um, <laughs> social, oh, social enterprise, there we go, there we yeah. go. So we're a social enterprise, which basically means that we're a private business, but that provides, uh, you know, community services as well. So things like the Toddler's Nature Group and, um, and education and, and social farming. So it was through, yeah, there was a grant for capital grant scheme for social enterprise and we were able to make uh, and purchase things like the geodome and a few other things through that, that will have made, will make having people on site uh, much more feasible and comfortable like public toilets and things. And um, that's the only grant I've accessed because like I say, farming grants, forestry grants, any of that, I haven't seemed to find, found a, find a way into. And any of the local enterprise grants when I spoke with them or the, uh, who else was I working with? Was it, um, or BIA or whatever, they're all looking for products that be, can be exported overseas or, and the, you know, their grants are very focused around online sales and, you know, for, or, um, you know, developing websites and, and skills that way. So there just mm -hmm. hasn't been anything that's kind of fitted for us. Um, mm -hmm. but we were fortunate to get the, the social enterprise one, which was a huge help to us, but it, didn't factor into the actual farming itself. It's more about the social side of the farm. Okay, perfect, thank you. Kate, where do you sell your produce mostly? What's, what are the main sources of, of sales? So going back to that, our tenant of diversity being resilience, which has been brilliant this year, especially because we, if we just sold to restaurants and cafes this year, we would have a real challenge and we'd be scrambling to find domestic customers. So we actually sell to cafes, restaurants, uh, just general domestic customer, any like anyone, but through a through a box scheme. Uh, we had a market in that loan before this, but now we've signed up to Neighbor Foods Market, so we're we're um, participating in two of them, and we also sell to shops as well, some veg shops and health food stores that um, then sell on the produce. 
And I just want to let you know there's so many comments saying what an excellent communicator you are and what a great presentation and, uh, and you know, Farming for Nature and I'm sure Burn Biotrust would really like to thank you for, for taking the time. So we'll just do one last question each probably if that's okay. Um, so my last one is from a breeder, Maloney, and are you harvesting all year or until a certain month and what subsidizes the shortfall? And, and what's, what's the last part, Bridget? the shortfall if you're not harvesting every every month so one of the questions um, before has been about like you know is this lifestyle sustainable and we could harvest all year but it would be a hugely reduced rate during winter um my goal though i i again we've talked about this in our own personal lifestyle we used you know we miss traveling and and doing bits so we're thinking that we will continue to take about half of December and most of January off. So our last veg box kind of would go out the second week in December, and then we would start supplying uh, veg again um, around kind of end of February, but we'd work February because you'd, you'd have to get this stuff done. But we'd like to have six weeks you know, off during winter where you know we're only doing the minimum uh, to keep everything happy. And, um, I, for those, that's a personal choice. You don't have to do it that way. You have options around if you grow enough volume of potatoes, onions, garlic, you can store it and you can still, uh, you know, if you get very clever with your rotations and how you grow things and what you can already have in the ground, you can definitely have things over winter. Um, and we will have certain stuff, but we've kind of made the choice not to be intense because the summer is, is very, very intense. I mean, you are out till eight or nine at night or, or later sometimes and, and you're up at like, you know, between five and six for harvesting days. So um, it's not for us. It's that's not we, we don't want to do that all year round. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but you, you could you could definitely. And then obviously you've got options for education and other forms to subsidize the short haul for ourselves. Um, we, we because we just you know we, we bulk it out in the summer we, we take it easier in the winter perfect thank you okay okay this is probably a fitting last question even though i know you answered some of it um brendan has asked have you long-term vision for the farm and land for example would you like to expand your holding or diversify your business offering so i am someone who loves ideas and i have more ideas than i have money or land um, I would adore to expand our holdings because I'd love to play around with some of the concepts that are being explored in like the UK and with wilding. Um, Isabella Tree wrote the book Wilding and their, their property about how they're creating sort of semi-wild meat and the animals are living in an ecological system and it's, it's amazing. But they have 3,000 hectares and no matter how many banks I rob, I don't think I'm going to get that just yet. I, but I would love to play around with that, even if it was to have one or two pigs on, you know, on, on 10 or 15 acres. And I'd love to do it because I would like to be working at creating that diversity of habitat and those grazing, uh, forest grazing systems where, you know, it's sort of temperate, um, temperate forest uh, climates. Um, but at right now, what we want to do is make the most of the land that we have, um, because it's like the market garden even itself is not fully up to production. Um, very excited at the idea of when it when it could be, and to see what that's bringing in and what that, you know how much food that's growing because that's that's a really exciting um, idea. One of the things that um, I know when I was in college was always being said about organics is that you can't grow enough food to feed the world on organic because you know you're growing less because you're not using uh, you know these extra fertilizers. But from what I have found from these methods, I think we're growing you know, four or five times the amount of food that other methods, other farming methods are growing on the same area of land. It's, you know, it's kind of phenomenal. Um, lots of ideas. Uh, I did cover them in the talk, so I won't go through them all, but, but yes, I would love more land. I would love to um, be able to grow the venture, uh, but obviously with any sort of growth, it's extra labor and it's new, new projects. So I've, I've been told I'm not allowed for a while until we kind of get a little bit more of a rhythm uh, with what we have at the moment. <laughs> great. Well, it's great to be enthusiastic. Thank you so much, Kate, for um, joining us tonight. You're phenomenal and you've got such a great 
business structure and it's lovely to see that nature is just the underlying structure for all of this and i think that's really powerful and you know thanks for sharing that with us that model um so over to pranjali as what's happening next next week i just wanted to give a uh, give a, a the next our next webinar is the Burren in the bronze age so this talk is going to explore the rich archaeological discoveries that have been made in two caves in the Burren, the glen curran cave and the monin cave so, uh, you know, these discoveries show that these dark spaces were of sacred significance to the inhabitants of the Burren at the time. So it should be fascinating. And uh, the speaker is uh, Dr. Marion Dowd, who is a lecturer in prehistoric archaeology at IT Sligo and her principal research centers on caves and how they have been used and perceived over the millennia. So um, it should be fascinating. We hope to see you next Wednesday and also if you haven't done so, please register for Burren in Bloom online. Um, it's uh, this year we are going to do all the celebrations of Burren in Bloom online. They're going to happen between 7 and 9 p.m. on the 3rd, 4th, 5th and 6th of June. So um, lots of interesting um, events, including discussions, talks and some family fun like quiz and art workshops. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, a farming for nature panel discussion with Bridget um, and some of the some of the amazing and inspiring farmers like Kate will be on. Um, so uh, please register at burnandbloom.com if you haven't done so already. But that's that's it for today. Thank you so much, Kate again. Thanks again, Kate. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys.